folks, and welcome to the podcast on a very important compound for life known as water. All life depends on water for its survival. It's the main reason why we're interested in finding water on other planets. Because we know that if we find water, then life, like we know it on Earth, is possible on those planets. To understand how water behaves, it's important to understand the molecule itself. As you know, it's made up of two hydrogen atoms covalently bonded to an oxygen atom. Although this is a covalent bond, the oxygen holds the shared electrons closer to its nucleus than the hydrogen atoms. This causes the oxygen end of the molecule to be more negative and the two hydrogen to be more positive. These opposite ends create what we call a polar molecule. Because of this polarity, water has some unique properties that most other compounds don't have. Four properties of water contribute to Earth's fitness for life. They are its cohesive and adhesive behavior, its high specific heat, its expansion upon freezing, and that it's a solvent for life. All of these are the result of water's polar property. The positive and negative charges on water on the water molecule make it attracted to other water molecules. These very weak bonds are called hydrogen bonds. Those bonds are denoted by these dotted lines here. Hydrogen bonds are weaker than both covalent and ionic bonds, but they are a force of attraction, in this case, between water molecules. If the water molecules slow down enough, as they do when it freezes, like you see in this diagram here, they form a matrix that creates more space between each water molecule than the water is in liquid form, as seen in this picture. This extra space in the ice is responsible for water expanding when it freezes and also decreases its density, making it float. Floating ice on lakes and ponds creates an insulation layer that keeps the water beneath from freezing solid and killing all the life within it. In this di diagram, you can better see how water molecules tend to attract one another. This attraction for like molecules is called cohesion and is responsible for these features, which you may see on very clean, waxy surfaces like a car here. The water beads up. The water molecules are attracted to other water molecules, making it bead up. The cohesion of water molecules on its surface creates surface tension that is strong enough to allow some insects to actually walk on its surface. Now, adhesion is the property of water that allows it to cling to other substances other than water. Water's polar characteristics cause it to be attracted to other polar substances, or it can induce a charge on the substance to which it clings. This adhesion causes a phenomenon known as capillary action. You can demonstrate this for yourself if you take something like a paper towel and dip it into water. You'll actually see the water crawl up the paper towel. This is due to the adhesion of the water molecules to the molecules of the paper towel. And this happens in many substances. It even happens to the surface of glass. You may have seen this as the meniscus in a graduated cylinder. Both cohesion and adhesion are responsible for water transport in plants, as seen in this very busy diagram. Water transport, as you know, starts down here in the roots and the water is actually pulled into the roots, not pushed. As water is pulled along, it enters vessels known as xylem in the roots. And these xylem vessels are continuous all the way up the stem, or in this case, the trunk of the tree. These water molecules pull each other along because they are attracted to one another. As the water, as the xylem enters the leaves, you can see the xylem as the veins in the leaves, the water exits by way of small pores in the leaves called stoma. There the water evaporates or transpires. As each water molecule leaves the leaf, it pulls another water molecule behind it, continuing this action. That's what's responsible for carrying water, in many cases, hundreds of feet high to the very top of a tree. Another important property of water is its high heat capacity which really means that it can store lots of heat before its temperature increases. This is why it's typically cooler near the coast in the summertime. The next time you see the weatherman reporting the temperatures, notice how 
in the wintertime, it's typically warmer near the coast than it is inland. And the opposite is true in the summer. It's typically cooler near the coast than it is in the summer. Water takes a long time to heat up, and it also takes a long time to cool down. Specific heat is responsible for the heat capacity of water. The specific heat is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a substance by one degree Celsius. Specific heat capacity of water is higher than most substances and do, is due to the result of water's polarity. Solid land has lower heat capacity than liquid water. In the case of the pie here, the crust has less water than the filling, so the crust cools down much more quickly. And finally, water is life's solvent. A solvent is a substance that dissolves another called a solute. A solvent and a solute create a solution. Solutions concentrations are increased when more solute is added. All of life's chemical reactions take place in an aqueous solution, which means that water is the solvent. Let's go to a demonstration of how water acts as a solvent. The link to this site is below this video window. I want you to go to this website after and play around with its features to learn more on your own. So here we are. We've got a container of water, a spigot to add more water if we want, and a spigot to let some water out. Over in this window here we have a small graph that shows the concentration of salt or sugar as we add it to the water. Here's some salt. I'm going to go ahead and shake that into the water and create a salt solution. Notice what happens to the concentration of the salt as I add it. This is kind of fun. Notice that the concentration of salt is increasing. I can shake it until all the salt is gone and I've reached a certain concentration here. Now I want you to predict what's going to happen to the concentration of salt water when I add more fresh water. I'm going to go ahead and add more water. Was your prediction correct? Well, if you notice, the concentration of the salt decreased because, obviously, I added more water. What do you think is going to happen if I let some of this water out? What's going to happen to the concentration now? Make a prediction. Notice the concentration of salt had not changed at all. I can let out even more water. Salt concentration stays the same. That's because we created a salt solution. And as the salt dissolved in the water, the molecules of salt, or in this case, the particles of salt, evenly distributed in the water. So no matter how much water I let out, I'm also letting out salt, so the concentration stays the same. Let me remove the salt and start again by resetting. Now to show you what happens to sodium as I add it to the water, we'll get down to the molecular level here. In sodium chloride, or table salt, we have the green dot represent, representing the chlorine and the red dot representing the sodium. If I allow that to hit the water, it completely dissociates, meaning that the, every chlorine atom gets separated from the sodium atom. When this happens, chlorine keeps the electron that it, was, that it had from sodium, making chlorine negative and sodium positive. If I reset that and add another type of compound, sucrose, sucrose comes in as a solid. Sucrose is made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen covalently bonded to each other. A covalent bond is stronger than the ionic bond that was holding sodium and chlorine together. So water's polar property is not powerful enough to separate the carbons from the hydrogens and the oxygens, but it is enough to separate the individual sugar molecules that were bonded to each other in a solid form. Now, at this level, we can see the individual water molecules, and they're moving around very busily because they have their own kinetic energy. As you heat a substance up, the particles will tend to move with respect to one another. In these water molecules, the red spheres represent the oxygen and the white, the hydrogen. If I stop this picture, you'll see that in most cases, the hydrogens seem to be closer to another oxygen
than they are to another hydrogen. This is because the hydrogens are forming hydrogen bonds with each of the, each of the neighboring oxygen. If I add some sodium chloride, and stop it quickly enough, I'll see that the, the negative chlorine tends to be surrounded by more of the positive hydrogen portions of the water molecule. And the positive sodium tends to be more surrounded by the negative oxygens. These forces are what pulled the ionically bonded sodium chloride apart. Let me reset that and add some sugar and see what happens to the sugar molecule. The hydrogen bonds from the water molecules are not strong enough to separate the covalent bonds of the sugar, but are strong enough to separate individual sugar molecules from one another, creating a sugar solution. Sugar does have on its surfaces lots of positive and negative charges equally distributed, which is why it dissolves in water. Substances that don't dissolve in water don't have these positive and negative charges on their surface. These substances are things like fats or lipids. Not having those charges on their surface is what makes it, it difficult for water to dissolve them. That's it for my lecture on the importance of water to life. I hope this was helpful. If you, miss, if you feel like you missed something, go back and watch it again. Write down any questions you might have, bring them to class for discussion. More importantly, watch this video again before we have the quiz as a great refresher. Thanks, and we'll see you back in class. If you feel like it, take me away and make it okay. I swear I'll behave. You won't.